to a snowy Thursday session of the Montgomery County Council. And we're going to have a discussion today about compensation cost trends before we proceed to other items on our agenda. And uh, the Council's Office of Legislative Oversight and the Council's Legislative uh, Analyst team has been working on evaluations of compensation cost trends. They've got some results to share with us, and we'll have discussion. So Craig Howard and Aaron Trompka, please uh, right. take us away. And we'll ask council members if they can hold their questions until after the presentation, and then we'll all be able to proceed that way. Thank you, Council President. Um, as mentioned, I'm Aaron Tromka with OLO, and this is a joint effort with central staff. I'm joined by Craig Howard, and also wanted to mention the um, help uh, of our partner, Jacob Sesker, who assisted on, the, on this uh, um, uh, uh, presentation. So we're going to give to you a presentation on compensation cost trends. And really what this is, a continuation of ongoing work that you've asked staff to do over the years. It started with back in 2010, work by OLO on a structural budget deficit report. You've gotten periodic reports on the cost of government. Um, and just as recently as this last budget season, both the GEO committee and the full council has asked for, for council staff and OLO to present on an ongoing basis information on sustainability. Um, the specific direction from the council president for this iteration was that we focus on compensation costs, which of course, as everybody knows, is the largest component of spending of expenditures by the four agencies. And for today, we're going to be looking specifically at county government. The only other thing I'll add is that the, the data that we use for this presentation um, isn't new. Um, we've included them and talked about them in, in different parts and pieces as part of budget packets and, and work sessions and staff reports over the years. Um, however, typically when we look at these data, we look at them in a, a single year budget time frame um, to try to figure out how to make all the dollars work for that year. So what's a little bit different about this presentation is we, we took the data and looked back historically five years to kind of to ask the question of how did the puzzle pieces fit together um, in the past? And then we did some, um, some you know, potential trends going forward to see how the puzzle pieces may fit together um, in the future to kind of get at the question of um, how can we tell if, if the recent compensation trends will be sustainable in the long term. And so on that sustainability point, what we're looking at is a comparison of two, two very simple sets of numbers. One is the dollars coming in, and two are the dollars going out. And something is sustainable if there is some sort of connection, nexus, equilibrium between those numbers. And that gets us into our report. The first part of what we'll do in the majority of this presentation will be a comparison of compensation costs and revenue growth trends. The idea being that if the revenues coming in are at the same pace as compensation growth, then things are sustainable. If not, then you might have a red flag to look at. So here are our compensation cost trends um, since FY14. We chose FY14 as our base year because that was the first year we were comfortably out of the recession. And so economic conditions were fairly stable during the six year time period. And it also six years is the county's horizon for a lot of fiscal planning. So we went back six years. And you'll see that during that time, compensation costs grew at an average annual rate of 2.7% a year. We'll compare that with county revenues that during the same period grew by about 3.5% a year. So at first glance, when you look at this data, everything fit very well, in fact, comfortably well with some, with some um, room to spare. FY14 through FY19, revenue growth was more than sufficient to accommodate the compensation costs. But the story is a little bit more complicated than that, and that's what we're here to explain. We want to start by showing you what compensation consists of. The majority of it, 71% of that is wages, 5% Social Security, 15% for group health insurance, and retirement is the final 8%. So you'll see that 71% of our compensation costs, and again, we're talking about the county government here, um, is wages, and the remaining 29%, a good portion of that, is, are for the various benefits. And what we're going to do now is show you the annual average growth rate in those over that six-year period. Again, the key to sustainability isn't whether or not you can shoehorn something in a one-year budget. The question is over time. And so the purpose of this presentation is to show trends over time. Over time in this period, wages grew by about 3.7% annually. Now, you might ask, what factors contributed to that? Because if you remember, weren't pay raises, which are wages, weren't they higher than 3.7%? 
And the answer is yes, they were. They ranged between 5.3 and 5.6% a year, composing of two elements, the general wage adjustment, which is the COLA, and the, the uh, service increment, or, or the STEP. But importantly, of only about two-thirds of the employees get both. About one-third of the employees are not eligible for the STEP. And so for those employees, that one-third of the, of the workforce got between 1 and 3.25% 1 and um, per year. And so that mitigates the effect. Another mitigating effect it comes from turnover, that when uh, a senior in years um, employee is replaced by somebody with, with less tenure, um, the wages can be less. And an effect in the opposite direction, over this time the workforce wasn't stagnant, it grew by 600 FTEs. Social Security grew, grew by about 4.2% during this time period, and group insurance grew by 6.3%. So the same question that we talked about with wages, so, so what factors caused that 6.3% increase in, uh, in group insurance costs? Uh, group insurance costs are typically, uh, uh, increases are typically um, a factor of two things. First is uh, just general healthcare inflation. As the cost of healthcare services increase, it, those costs increase for, uh, for those who use it. And the second is the actual use of healthcare by individuals. Since we're largely self-insured, you know, as employees use healthcare, uh, we bear the brunt of that cost. Um, we did find that the county trends of 6.3% actually uh, aligned with the national trends in the same period. Um, nationwide, it was about 5.5% five, five to 6.5% increases uh, during the same time period. So we weren't out of line with, with what was happening um, across the country. Um, also, there's two components of the group, in, group health insurance that we're showing uh, as part of this presentation. There's the active employee um, group insurance costs, and those increased 4.9% on an average annual basis during this time period. And, and the active employees are the larger chunk of the, uh, of the group insurance costs. And then, but the retiree pay-as-you-go costs, the cost that we're paying for current retirees, grew at an average annual rate of 9.3%, so almost double that of the active employees. The expenditure data I did want to note, um, as I mentioned, includes the active employee and the retiree pay-as-you-go um, group insurance costs. It does not include the OPEB pre-funding. Um, and as a separate project, Aaron and I are working on a, a report on, on, on a retiree health costs that will go much deeper into the OPEB pre-funding um, costs and, and issues, and as well as the retiree pay-as-you-go. So now we've got a curiosity in the data. Remember we said that the compensation grew at a slower rate than revenues, and revenues grew by 3.5%, yet wages, social security, and group insurance all are growing at a faster rate, that, as it says in the black box. So what happened? The answer is with retirement. Retirement decreased by an average of 7.5% over this time period. In fact, in one year, in FY17, retirement costs for the county government, driven mostly by the defined benefit plan, decreased by 30% in one year. So what happened there? What caused this precipitous drop? Three factors. One is sustained inflation over this time was very, very low, and we put dollars aside for pensions assuming COLAs based on higher inflation. When inflation came in lower, our liabilities were reduced. Secondly, the very strong market environment, stock market environment, meant that our, our investments well exceeded the 7.5% to assume, so our, our assets grew. And thirdly, the, with, with pensions and, and other things, there are experience studies, periodic evaluations of the experience that, that happens with the, with the employees and the retirees. And during this time period, we had an experience study that led to a decrease in what we had to in, uh, contribute annually. What's interesting to note about all three of these bullets are you'll be hard pressed to, to, to believe that these are gonna continue into the future. Inflation, the first bullet, has already ticked up. We're all aware at the present day the volatility of the stock market. And in terms of experience and, and actuarial assumptions, we already know that there are new mortality tables that will be included in the next experience study in a year, and the county's going to get a big hit. So there's no reason to expect these to continue. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at that annual rate of, of, in, of revenue increase of 3.5%, and look how much we spent above that in those first three um, columns to find out how fast did we spend an expenditure above the sustainability level of, of revenue growth. And what you'll see in the shaded area is that over this time period, we spent about $136 million for those three areas above what would have been sustainable if, if your benchmark was, was revenue growth. 
Um, and that was 29 million in, in this current year alone. But the cost savings from, from um, retirement cost reductions netted us $80 million in that period to the good and 40 million of that in, in the current fiscal year. So one of the important takeaways to learn from this was that we had a perfect storm in the positive way for the retirement. The retirement costs went down precipitously and that helped offset the higher growth rates in wages, social security, and group insurance. So lesson number one from, 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 this, from this look back is we paid for our co compensation cost increase in good part because of savings from retirement. So now we've talked about the expenditure side. Now let's look at the, at the revenue side. And here's again the, the chart we showed before about revenue growth over the six year period. And generally when we think of revenue growth, we think of changes in employment, wage growth, property values, capital gains, and those are all true. Those drive revenue growth. We, that's sort of what we call the organic revenue growth, the things that are happen as a function of the economy. But also remember that revenue growth is a, pol is a function of policy decisions, specifically tax rate changes. And so when you look at this, this table, note the chart, please note that the last of our energy tax reductions occurred in FY15. That had a minor hit on our revenues, but much more significantly was the property tax increase in, in FY17. So now we bring you back to the comparison that we started with, where we showed that compensation grew at a much slower rate than revenues. What we wanted to do is ask the question, what about that organic growth rate, the one that was specifically only a function of the economy and not of property tax or of tax rate changes? And what we calculated was that the average annual growth rate of revenues absent the, the two policy changes was about 2.6% per, a year. So now we have a very different picture. Over the six year time period, revenue growth was slightly below compensation and slightly below even after the savings from, from retirement. So we gave this comparison before against the actual revenue growth. We're now gonna show the comparison based on what we're calling the organic, the, the growth rate in, in revenues based on, on just economic factors. And again, it's the shaded area above the line and for here, what the takeaway is that we spent $242 million above the rate of revenue growth in, in those three compensation. But again, we had a bit of an offset of $80 million um, from the retirement side. So another way to look at it, if you look at the difference between the 242 and the 80, is absent the tax rates alone, we overspent or spent above the rate of, of revenue growth by about $162 million and had we not benefited from the, from the retirement, had retirement not decreased by that, then the full $242 million would have been what we spent above the rate of revenue growth. So that section was, was looking at um, what happened in the past five years. So the next section is kind of uh, looking forward. So what might we project um, over the next, uh, next five years of our fiscal plan? And so we're gonna look at projected future year revenue growth based on the county's approved fiscal plan, as well as projections for the future year compensation costs based on each of the components that we ran through um, uh, uh, from, the, from the past. So this first slide is the, is the same information you saw before of the, uh, the county's revenue between FY14 and FY19, um, and with the 3.5% increases with the tax rate changes and the 2.6% is what Aaron was calling the organic uh, tax rate change, or the organic revenue change without the tax rates. And this next section is our projections based on the approved fiscal plan. So the approved fiscal plan shows an average annual increase of 2.7% uh, um, in revenues um, through FY24. And of course, the, the actual numbers may vary from year to year, but the 2.7% is kind of uh, uh, how we normalize that. So given those revenue costs, what might be the compensation costs going forward? First, you have the average, for wages, we had the average annual growth rate of 3.7% um, in the past. And what that will be going forward will depend on the um, negotiated labor agreement. So we don't know what those wages um, will be exactly. Social Security largely grows as a function of, of wage growth. So that will be kind of correlated to what happens with wages. With group insurance, we had that 6.3% increase um, 
over the past five years. And again, this is a function of healthcare utilization and, and inflation rates. The county's actuaries project um, increases of between 5 and 7.3% through FY24. So it's likely that we'll see a similar average annual increase in group insurance costs that we've seen um, over the past five years. And then retirement. Of course, this is where we had the big reductions um, that Aaron mentioned in, in uh, minus 7.4% average um, annually over the past five years. And the, the three factors that kind of led to that decrease, inflation, um, investment returns, and demographic experience are, are not likely to occur uh, going forward. So while we don't know exactly what's going to happen with retirement, it's unlikely that we will have <clears throat> that same perfect storm um, of reduced retirement costs um, going forward. And then one other thing that's important to mention is that all the compensation elements um, are a function of workforce size. Um, so net additions or, subs or subtractions to the workforce will affect the wage and benefit costs going forward. So given the, the revenue projections and the potential um, compensation cost increases, you know, we're going to look at now how do they align together and is there a potential issue going forward. And we go back to that OLO report from November 2010, which defines a structural budget gap as one that exists when projections of expenditures exceed projections of revenues on a persistent and recurring basis. So this slide shows our, we start with our current compensation costs um, this year, which is uh, $975 million. And if those compensation costs um, through FY24 were to increase at the projected rate of revenue growth, 2.7%, we'd end up at about $1.11 billion in FY24. But now let's look at a different scenario. Let's assume that the compensation costs will uh, grow at the same rates as, as they did between in the last five years for wages, Social Security, and group insurance. And let's assume 0% change in retirement. So we'll hold that constant at the FY19 level. We won't show any increases in retirement, but we're also not assuming the decreases that we saw over the past uh, five years. So in that scenario, shown by the, the, the blue section here, you end up at about $1.1 um, $77 billion in FY24. And that blue section is your potential structural imbalance or gap that we might have to deal with. And when you look at it as part of the, um, on this chart where it shows the entire compensation base, you know, that, that blue sliver doesn't look um, very big. But if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that that net, uh, that net difference over the five years is just under $200 million. Um, so that $200 million is your potential structural gap um, if revenues stay at that 2.7% um, growth rate while compensation costs um, grow at a higher rate. So to sum up this section, we have uh, three findings and takeaways. First, from FY14 through 19, uh, the revenue growth was sufficient to cover the compensation cost growth because of the tax rate increases and the unprecedented reductions in retirement costs. Absent these circumstances, uh, growth in compensation costs would have created significant budget shortfalls, um, which would have been greater than $100 million in FY19 alone, and that the approved fiscal plan projects annual, uh, average annual revenue increases at 2.7% um, through FY24. So if compensation costs uh, grow uh, above that rate, we have a pot potential imbalance. So we have one more short piece. We have one more short piece to show you, and this is talking about the issue of how we spend new compensation dollars, because there's compensation for increases for existing positions, and there are compensation increases for, for new positions. We have a short analysis of that, and this looks again at the county government, the new wage spending on wages, Social Security, and group insurance. There was no new spending for retirement during this time frame. And we're just going to go back to FY17, the year of the, of the property tax increase. What you see in blue are the dollars spent for increases for existing positions, whether that be in, in wages or benefits. And you'll see then in the gray, the dollars spent for new positions. And you'll see that of the $46 million, 82% of that was spent for uh, increases in, for existing positions. In FY18, we had a very, very different experience in two ways. First, you'll see the shift in emphasis. The emphasis in FY18 was very much in favor of new positions and less so in favor of dollars for, for uh, existing positions. But the other interesting thing is the size of the bar. The bar decreased as we got one year away from the, from the tax increase. In FY19, the bar is even shorter and there were no new dollars for 
um, new positions. Now, I should note that whether or not you're adding dollars for existing positions or you're adding dollars for new positions in one year, whatever you add in that year becomes the base of the next year. And so as you're thinking about where to spend the dollars and how to spend that, they're, they're the gift they keep on giving. And I'm going to show you also FY20. You may ask, how do we know FY20? We haven't negotiated agreements. Um, we haven't, the council hasn't seen anything from, from the county executive. But we already do know a portion of that. Because the way the negotiated agreements work, many of the pay increases for the current year kick in in the middle of this current year. And so the full effect of them won't be felt until next year. And so we've already dedicated $9 million in the county government for pay increases that took effect in FY19 uh, that will spill over into FY20. So our takeaways here, our findings here, is that there's a budget trade-off. If you've got X number of dollars for, for compensation increases, you have to decide whether or not to spend them on new positions, to spend them on increases for existing employees. And the, our history shows that we've had different emphasis in different years, as you saw by the contrast in the bars that we showed before. And our last takeaway is that we have to keep in mind that these mid-year pay increases do consume part of the next year's budget, even before that um, budget year begins. So that concludes our presentation. I think we'll turn it back to council. We will note that in our packet on the bottom of page three and the top of page four, staff has offered some suggestions of what next steps could be and what the council's role could be in reviewing the state on an ongoing basis. Um, and we'll be glad to present that to you. But for now, we're, we're turning it back to, to the council president. All right. Thank you very much, Aaron and Craig. Um, seems like we have a story that is sort of good news and bad news. We've been able to match our rate of expenditure increase on compensation generally to our rate of compensation uh, to our revenue growth, but uh, we've been able to do that because of something that was somewhat or perhaps very unusual, which is being able to substantially reduce our retirement savings. And as you say, it's unclear that that will will have that. Uh, that available to us to offset that in the future. So the, the compensation decisions of the last few years are going to potentially, you know, put a squeeze on us in the next few, we'll see. And uh, so that is interesting. Um, I, I would note that, you know, the annual rates I observe are, it, it doesn't mean if, if revenues grow by 2.7% that, that the wage package, you know, that we deem affordable will also be 2.7%. Those are two very different percentages. A, you know, a, a general wage adjustment and step combination can be more than, as a percentage term, the rate of increase of revenue and still fit within a rate of increase of revenue that is, you know, less, uh, just the way that it works out. So I'll say two things to that. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. As we saw, that w wages increased for most employees in the f in the five to five and a half range. Yet right. For salaries, I'm sorry, individual ind employee salaries, while well, wages only grew by 3.7 percent, that's because a, a good portion of the employee base doesn't get the second exactly. pay increase. So that's one. But, so that works in one direction. What works in the other direction, though, is as Craig pointed out, with health group health insurance, growing at a higher rate, a substantially higher rate in the 6 or 7 percent rates, that's going to eat into what you, can, what you can afford for the other elements of compensation, most notably wages. All right. So um, I, I'm interested to know how this can be worked into our spending affordability process or just our guidelines in general. I know you said that you had that in your next steps, but... Could I just ask for you to talk sure. about that a little sure. bit? So yeah. if council members have the packet and we're on the bottom of page three and the top of page four? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So on the bottom of, of page three, we list the five variables that you need to know to do this, this analysis. You need to know projected revenue growth. You need to know pay adjustments. You need to know group insurance cost trends, retirement cost trends, and changes in workforce sizes. Those are the five variables that you can put into a puzzle and figure out whether or not things are sustainable. And what Craig and I realized when we were discussing this is there are really two times of the year where these come in focus. In the fall, we know three of these five variables. 
Usually, you'll get in a couple of weeks a um, fiscal plan update with new revenue numbers. So the revenues, that's the size of the pie, the rate of growth, that is known in the mid to late fall. Also, the way that um, group insurance and retirement work um, happens is that at the end of the fiscal year, at the end of June 30th, there are new valuations, there are new um, CAFR information, and so we know the rate of growth that gets plugged into the budget then. So in the fall, you know the size of the pie, you know how much roughly is going to be spent next year for insurance increases, and you know what, what's going to be uh, needed for retirement. What's not known are what the executive recommends and the council will, will um, recommend in terms of employee pay raises and compensation and, and uh, workforce size either increases and decreases. So on the top of page four, what we're suggesting is that there be a fall check-in. Similar to the fiscal plan update that we have, we can have a compensation trend cost update where the council will hear from the executive each fall. How to do it in election year is a little bit, is a little bit different in a transition year, but generally would hear from the executive and you'd know the size of the pie and you'd know what's left over as a target for a sustainable increase is for compensation and, and uh, pay increases and workforce size as a whole. Um, that's a way for the council to give, to understand what's the target, what's sustainable, and maybe send a message to the executive about what to expect to see through the collective bargaining process. Right. In the spring, during your budget process, all five variables are known because the three that we mentioned you have in the fall are done, and the executive will have recommended workforce size and compensation pay increases. And you can then go back and compare what the budget is in, for, in, from, in front of you as recommended by the executive against what was known in, in the fall. So our recommendation is, as detailed on the top of page three and four, is to have a fall check-in to sort of set the, the standards. I'm not sure it should be as formal and as rigid as the SAG guidelines, but more of a, more of a target. And then to see in the spring whether or not the recommended budget fits into that target. Thank you. That's really helpful. I think the council has often struggled with how to uh, formulate a view on affordability in advance of the bargaining process, and it it doesn't work to anyone's benefit because you know the the unions go through bargaining and they don't really know until the council actually f truly takes it up at the which is sort of the eleventh hour of the process what the decision will be. And I think the council struggles to evaluate affordability as a general matter. It's probably one of the hardest things that we are tasked to do. And um, seeking some way to at least have a framework, you know, and it, it would be very useful. Um, and I would note the, you know, the guide of revenue growth does not mean that in any one year, you know, it couldn't be more or that it couldn't be less. That's not the suggestion. It's just a framework for council members to understand the affordability of compensation generally. And then, you know, that as you've outlined a way that there could be a check in on that. And it's not determinative, but it is a, again, it's a framework to think about the issue. Um, that seems like it's, it's frankly badly needed. Um, Aaron, you look like you want to and, add and something there. I totally agree that, that no single year has to fit exactly. What we right. can do as staff is we can then calculate for you if you took that first year and replicated it over six years, would there be a sort of a gap like Craig showed or would there not? And so we can give you a framework to look at that one year to, um, recommendation and give it a perspective over multi years. Very interesting. All right. Um, council members have some lights on. Our county executive elect, Mr. Elrich. So uh, it's interesting, but I would say that the budget is a lot more complex than this because I just looked at, you know, what's the projected revenue growth? The projected revenue growth is $690 million, which is $570 million <clears throat> more than your projected compensation growth, right? Well, I mean, it's not that compensation is outgrowing revenues. It's growing. The only way to avoid it growing would be not to increase any compensation, freeze your health care benefits, 
and do everything else. So things are going to grow, and that has to be factored into what's the larger picture. Obviously, if it consumes an increasing portion of the pie, it limits other options, but at the same time, uh, county government has the ability of finding savings, not just in labor, but say, for example, procurement, where I routinely have volunteer companies coming in and saying they spend $5,000 less per vehicle than if they went through county procurement to buy a vehicle. Um, so there are ways to go at making sure the budget balances and numbers work more than just through this lens. And I think, you know, we should all remember that this is a complex mix of things and that a county executive is going to have to look at everything that goes into increasing costs. You didn't even get into the school system, but could you be a whole other factor which alters how much of that $690 million is available for either the county government or anything else we're doing? Um, so, I'm, so I look at this as thank you for the briefing, and I'm awesomely aware of <laughs> the limitations both on the ability to raise money and the ability to, to spend money. And I just am trying to look at this and kind of not just focusing only on the labor component of what we all face going forward, but the entire component of what we face going forward. It's, it's kind of why I talked a lot about how I wanted to drive down to the extent possible some of the costs of government because you know, I was kind of like hypothetically aware of these numbers and you've kind of put flesh on the bone to, I think, it points out the limitations. The limitations are pretty clear. And how we respond to those limitations, hopefully, is going to be complex. Um, that's my two cents. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll also join the conversation. I, I think that um, we are, uh, again, we're challenged to have a framework on affordability. And there are times when we might decide that we need to make a change in our workforce. We need to add a lot more people, as we did several years ago. We felt that class size was insufficient. And so if compensation grew as a share of the pie that year, it's because we decided that was what we needed. That's what this county needed. So it's not a hard and fast rule that you know, it can never grow as a share of the pie. I think this is a trend issue that we're trying to understand and understanding whether uh, if we just stay on the course we are on, is compensation going to continue to eat up a larger share of the pie or is it essentially a sustainable yeah. share? And then from there you can help understand decisions about workforce size or other types of expenditures that you may wish to make. I mean, it, again, I think it, for me it's just a framework to think about affordability, which is one of the hardest things to you know, to grapple with here. I, I can just dovetail on that, that this period is also the period that we restored cuts to libraries and rec that had been pretty much devastated in the recession. And so you've got some growth which, because of the restorations we made, hopefully we don't have to make large bites going forward. I think class size obviously is going to continue to be an issue if we, if we build classroom space we always have to remember a class, new classroom space comes with new operating expenses, particularly the teacher to teach in that classroom. Or early childhood, or for early example, childhood. might require hiring new early childhood educators. Yep. Um, or paying other people who are doing it, not necessarily through the, doing it through the government, but doing it in the private sector, but helping people afford to pay for it. So we've got a complex set of decisions we're going to have to make. Right. And I think the... Together, the operative word uh, being... Together, indeed, as always. Uh, I, I think, I, again, I think the takeaway here is partly that we, we kept things within bounds over the last number of years, but there are also concerns about the next couple of years. Mr. Hucker, uh, I believe you're next. Sorry, let me advance, advance the mic. Yes, Mr. Hucker. Thank you, Council President. I think, <coughs> I think Mark said um, a lot of what I wanted to say. Um, but no, it was better said than I would say it. Um, but I, I want to thank Aaron and Craig and uh, Jacob and Absentia and Marlene for all the hard work on this. I know it reflects a lot of work, uh, much, much more time than it takes to go through all the slides. Um, and it's very, very helpful to us. Um, um, 
I guess just to elaborate a little bit on what Mark said, I, this is always a hotly debated topic during the budget season, um, especially. And I would want the two or three people that are probably watching us at home to come away with the impression, with the understanding that um, confirm, even tell me if I'm wrong about any of this. We have county employees and we have contractors, right? Uh, you looked into county employee wage costs and not contractors, starters, Correct. right? Yes. Um, and then we have county employees that are in the bargaining unit and other ones, many that are not in the bargaining unit, and you clarified that some are eligible for steps and other ones aren't. Right. So right. there's always a debate in the media and, and you know, in, in uh, civic associations, neighborhood associations, many groups that we all uh, talk to all the time about how quickly we're raising salaries for our county employees. And some people think we don't do it fast enough, and some people think we do it too fast, but that's only a small part of the puzzle. Correct? Right. So the, the right. data we showed you are all county employees, whether they're right. represented or not. Right. And then in addition to that, within the pie, the slice of the pie that's county employees, a n good number of those people are in management, right? Um, and that's that's included in your aggregate number, but not disaggregated, correct? That, that is included, correct. Right. Okay. Um, so that's another, obviously, piece of the complicated puzzle we have to look at, but one that isn't looked at very often, both our, the growth in management positions and the um, the compensation, uh, Council Member Leventhal did some good work on this, but comparing our compensation to surrounding jurisdictions, to the federal government, yeah. to other uh, large employers that we have to compete with for talent. Um, but that's not, you didn't, that's not within the scope no, of your th study here. This was strictly a exercise in affordability, right. not, not in, in merit. Right. I wouldn't want people to take away that we should, you know, cut, it's hard to find a significant savings by cutting our part-time crossing guards, for example. Um, and, and easier to find savings in other areas of the county budget. Um, and, and I did find the, what I was looking for about how much people also have to consider how much of it is wage growth versus the growth in actual positions, right, in pins. Um, okay, so um, I also just had a question. I guess we're going to have to repeat some of this. We always do this in the budget season, um, and it's, I guess, interesting to have it now, but some of this is going to change because we'll have a – We'll have four new council members that will have to look at this who aren't here. I guess council member elect was Albert Albernos was here for a minute, um, a few minutes. I don't mean to dis distinguish his, just to diminish his uh, participation, but they'll have to look at this and get up to speed quickly. We have outgoing council members that um, I hope will stay involved as taxpayers, and we have a new county executive who's going to have to make a lot of hard decisions on this, and I, I hope we have some. Yes, I'm sure we'll hear from my constituent, Council Member Leventhal. I, I don't know whether you'll hear from me, but I will certainly pay my taxes. <laughs> Excellent. You guys can't go suddenly conservative. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, we'll have to repeat this and again do our usual annual deep dive in the GEO committee, I'm sure, Madam Chair, right? Um, so it's, while it's helpful to have now, I. Um, it's, it's a little distracting to be able to focus on it, in the, especially on a, on a day like today, on the first day of snow day of the year when constituents expect to um, be able to reach us on multiple platforms at any time. So anyway, thank you for, very much for your help. Um, I look forward, I guess, to uh, getting back to this um, and getting deeper into some of these disaggregated numbers. Thank you. Council Vice President and Chair of the GEO Committee, Nancy Navarro. Thank you, um, Mr. Tromka, Mr. Howard, Marlene, Jacob, everybody for putting this together. Um, you know, as I was briefed on this and as I'm sitting here listening, uh, the word that keeps popping in my head is context, right? It's so important for us to make sure that any time we take up any particular slice of very complicated uh, efforts in terms of how we manage our finances um, is context. And so, it is important to understand exactly what this represents, and this is just one very small piece. I mean, we've had other reports. Um, I look forward to the recommendations I think are very useful for us to uh, pretty much add this, you know, as we look at our fiscal plan, but having this as a routine check-in uh, in the way that is proposed here, I think it's important. Um, and I would venture to say that I think this needs to be entire, you know, council, a conversation. I, I think it's great for GEO to go very deep into some things, but the truth of the matter is that we are going to have four new council members uh, coming in, and so this is very important baseline um, information for us, you know, moving forward. Um, but the only thing that I would add, ask is for us to work on understanding 
the context. This is about affordability. And we always say, you know, spending affordability guidelines, for example, are not about need, they're about affordability. Well, the reality is that if we're gonna look at something like this, we need to look at everything. We need to look at the need, which continues to grow, the expectations that our constituents have vis-a-vis -vis our employees and how they deliver services and, and, and all kinds of supports, um, the challenges that remain out there, and uh, and we're going to have to work hand in hand with council uh, executive uh, with county executive elect uh, Elrich in terms of fitting in that puzzle. And so I, I think this is very important and useful. And what you have demonstrated is that year by year we've had different challenges, and we've had to address them in different ways. I mean, if we really want to you know talk about this more holistically, we had to make some extraordinary decisions right after the the recession. I mean, we rebased the school system's budget for God's sake. You know, we had to look at changing, you know, the structure of benefits. I mean, we've had to do a lot of things to respond to the expectations of our constituents. So, again, this is one slice, one little slice of everything that we have to do. Um, but I would look, I look forward to working with all of you to then incorporate these briefings as a full council conversation, but also looking at some other pieces for context, especially for our new colleagues. I don't think. It's almost unfair to just kind of drop this there <laughs> and just kind of freak everybody out um, without the entire picture. Um, because this is not how we make our decisions. And it's also unfair for our constituents to think that somehow, you know, this is the only thing we need to look into. So I, I appreciate the briefing. I was a little bit puzzled by the timing of it because, again, we have, you know, new county executive, new council member, so we're gonna have to repeat this all over again. But I look forward to working with you and my colleagues to see how we can enhance the context of, of this conversation going forward um, and create, a, I would say, an enhanced culture. Um, because I would be remiss if I don't say that, yes, it's been frustrating um, every year, I think, for us here on the council to try to you know, understand clearly what is the true state of our fiscal situation vis-a-vis -vis the budget, you know, the decisions that we have to make, and then sometimes after we make them that we find out that perhaps there was some other revenue picture coming in and numbers, and it, it, you know, I, I think this opens up an opportunity for an enhanced relationship with the executive and the finance team um, for us to work as partners and, uh, and really truly support our employees who at the end of the day are the ones who are delivering all this uh, extraordinarily important services to our constituents. Um, so anyway, that's, you know, that's my goal. Um, I think especially uh, as we transition as the ne next new year. Um, and again, we'd look forward to the input from all my colleagues for things that GEO could go a little bit deeper, but do believe that this should be, you know, in, uh, council discussions um, versus just, you know, one committee. Thank you. I think that's a good point. Uh, it is. I think when you get to this kind of issue, it's really, it's a full council decision. It's a, and the full council needs to be aware of the issues. And so, cause it underlies everything that we do. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, uh, the research having been done and, and the need to begin the d discussion, um, urgently is, is certainly why I wanted to bring it up now. And I think it's a dry run of what would be a fall annual process and I, I like your framework of the fall and the spring and it, I, um, I share Ms. Navarro's uh, support for proceeding to work it into our program. I think we can begin with that. Mr. Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you for this report. I've actually seen it twice now, and and though uh, it was noted that we're going to have to see it again, it, you know, it's like a movie. Sometimes you notice things in the second the second time you watch it that you didn't see the first time, and this is this is um, this is not just light reading. This is this is. Uh, an interesting uh, puzzle, and, and I think uh, Council Vice President mentioned this. This is a puzzle that has to fit together, and that's what we're going to have to try to do. Um, you know, budgets, budget revenues, um, many times are just a series of assumptions, the revenues. But the, the costs pretty much are much more known in many cases going into a budget because you've negotiated something, you you know what the what the what the uh, what a, a vehicle is going to be costing you, and and you have a better idea. So the 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 bigger concerns that are the we need both sides of it. It's just like any other accounting accounting uh, problem. 
but but you have to stop and figure out exactly whether we're projecting our revenues in in the best way possible and and that's a difficult thing to do i mean as we saw last year or this year i guess of uh, fiscal year um that um that 50 people changed the the tenor of of their revenues in in montgomery county i mean 50 people out of a million people so that's a big that's a big discussion and and we have to try to figure out whether or not we can get a better handle on how we're doing it. And it's a tough thing. I mean, how are you going to figure out what 50 people are going to do? But, but that's a tough thing. The other thing that we, that, uh, is that we talk about is their reserves. Uh, the, the, uh, we're working towards their 10% reserve. And, and at some point when we get to the 10% reserve, you just have to, because this year you have to add what is 10% reserve and then some from the, the years prior. But in, in <clears throat> once you get to the years prior reserve that's finally there, whether or not that gives you some extra, even though it's revenue coming in, whether or not that gives you some extra uh, monies that, 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 the, that the government has in order to, to uh, have it, a, is it a different reserve? Uh, it, it, because what we have now is we really don't have, we have all these reserves, but I, I always look at it that you don't have any money, extra money. It's not like it's a savings that you can say, we just have a snowy day and, and we can reach into our savings until we can catch up. We don't really have that. And we need to work towards that. And, and, and I think this is something that, that, that we can obviously continue to keep in mind. And the other thing is that we talk about is the, the attrition rate uh, for, for our, our uh, workforce. Um, and, and that happens, there, it's a tough thing to predict in many ways. I mean, we have the drop programs, and you know that someone, when they might be leaving, but you don't know how fast you can hire and how fast all of those types of things. So there's all of these moving parts that, that I think over time we certainly are, are doing, from the time that I have seen here, we're certainly doing a, as good a job as we can do in many cases. And, and you know, the other thing is that, that we, you know, the, another elephant in the room is the debt, the debt that we are co having in Montgomery County. And I always like to mention it's if, we, if it was a department, it would be the third largest department that we have in the county. And that's something that we're, and I can tell you, especially from the GO Committee, from Government Operations Committee, was that all, all of us on that committee and, and all of the other people sitting up here are very aware of, that we have got to try to change that so that we don't just keep borrowing, but we, we sort of live within our own means. Not to say we're going to get rid of borrowing, because we can't and shouldn't, but, but so that we can live within our own means. But this report really is an eye-opening report, you know, the, the discussion. And I, and I appreciate the fact that, that you've done it, and I know it wasn't an easy thing to do. And uh, I, I uh, just want to thank you for all that. Thanks. Make a good point about debt. We are reducing our annual borrowing amount because we can't afford the, the service level. Yeah. We don't think it's wise to spend as much money on debt service as we are spending now. So we have made some very tough decisions to change the trajectory of that, and I think we're you know, potentially going to have to grapple with a similar issue here uh, in the next few years. Mr. Elrich. I, I just want to piggyback on something Nancy said. Um, when, I, when I look back on what this council did after the recession, I thought um, people showed remarkable restraint. I mean, I remember a meeting we had early on where we were talking about um, I, I guess what is that meeting we have in the f in after everybody comes in in January and we were sitting the retreat, and it was like everybody's got to kind of mutually agree that no one's going to be the hero of any one project because then we'll never have any restraint and we won't do the right thing. And we held that all the way through. And I think it's important for you, those of you staying on the council, to bring that lesson to the incoming council members because nothing has changed. I assure you, my being county executive will not open a faucet of money. I, I know you guys are <laughs> you guys are disappointed, but like I didn't know there was I object, <laughs> sir. I thought you were squirreling it away in your office. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I tried to be very I tried to be very conservative about what I no, I tried to be really conservative about what I said through the whole campaign because I knew there wasn't going to be any magical money. And I think it's important that, that to the extent that it's possible that we start the next government round here with a sense that, you know, 
the faucets aren't open. We're going to need to be as thoughtful and deliberate about things as we've we've been in the past. We should, I feel we should continue to do the things that, th that we did that I thought were right with the restoration of key services that people counted on. But we have to look very closely about what we're going to add. And I just assure you that I am looking very closely at what I had. I will not set a bad example for the rest of you on the council and claim all, all right to proclaim new things to do while you guys are are hamstrung, I think we're all going to be, have to be thoughtful about what we do going forward. And so I thought that, that what you said, Nancy, was, you know, was really dead on, um, that we're, we're all going to have to be team players in this, and I will be a team player with you all. Thank you for that comment. I see Nancy nodding. Um, and again, I think since we're doing it together, I, I want to raise a concern here. You know, you, we've all heard this. You know, we've just received a presentation that says, absent some significant change, we, we have a sustainability issue. Uh, we have been able to get through over the last several years because our retirement fund contributions have been zeroed out, and that may not continue in the future. So that needs to be there for our you know, obviously our next county executive is sitting here and he's received this and our, our bargaining partners need to understand, like, this is going to be a challenging few years unless there's some other, you know, unless something happens that we can't foresee at this moment. We're heading into some challenging discussions. Mr. Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. Let me just say that um, this presentation and the spirit is not lost on the chair of the education committee who uh, is in charge of half of our budget uh, and 90 percent of which is compensation and so we've had those conversations with superintendent smith uh, to talk about what the ramifications are moving forward when it comes to uh, our responsibilities to uh, our employees but also our responsibilities uh, to our overall constituents when it comes to building a sustainable budget uh, for our future. And so from that perspective, there are going to be tough conversations that have to be had. And I think it's important for us to do that. Uh, no one's talking about going back on promises, but we are talking about restructuring the way we're moving forward. And I think it's incredibly important for us to make sure that folks hear that and understand, you know, the way we've been doing things just isn't sustainable any longer. And it really requires us to really start looking at new and innovative ways in which we can address the needs that continue uh, to grow here in Montgomery County. Um, we are a county who is becoming poorer. I will say it again, who's becoming poorer. We have more poorer people coming into Montgomery County, and so therefore our needs are increasing. That means less tax base and more needs. Uh, and so from that perspective, we've got to figure out ways in which uh, we can balance uh, those uh, competing interests. And so I, I think this is a great start for us. I think that there's much more that needs to be done. I look forward to our county executive, uh, certainly uh, taking first stab at this as always, and uh, the council continuing to put its mark and stamp uh, on what we think is going to continue uh, to put us in firm uh, uh, economic footing. Uh, you know, our uh, incoming, I'll just assume, our incoming council president um, who chairs GO, uh, it's actually a really good time for us to have that experience uh, at a time in which we'll be making a lot of these key decisions. Uh, it's going to be uh, imperative for us to make sure that we uh, have our new members uh, acclimated very quickly uh, to some of these challenges. I you know, had a chance to read a lot of the literature that they put out uh, to their constituents uh, about things that they wanted to have happen. The unfortunate challenge is all of those things cost tremendous amounts of money, uh, money that we don't have. In fact, when we're looking at cost savings, we're going in the opposite direction. Uh, and so it will be important. And again, I say that not to be disrespectful to my colleagues, but just to say that that's the reality that we find ourselves in. Uh, we've had the luxury of doing this, as you've heard from my colleagues, uh, for a number of years now. In fact, eight. The very first year that I came in, uh, the very first year that Councilmember Reamer came in, 
uh, we had a budget savings plan on our desk day one. Uh, and that's something that, again, uh, has dictated and shaped a lot of what's happened. You heard Councilmember Navarro talk about our rebasing of the school systems. These, these are things that are not easy. You're talking about record property tax increases that then resulted in us having uh, term limits pass. Uh, these are all things that are realities that are out there. Uh, and as a person who was just at Kerwin Commission yesterday, uh, who was going back and forth with our Secretary of Budget, uh, uh, former Senator Brinkley, Secretary Brinkley, about what the governor intends to do when it comes to funding Kerwin uh, and recommendations there, I find myself very concerned about what the state and its resources are that are going to be provided uh, for Montgomery County, which makes this even more important uh, if we're going to be serious about trying to do some things around early childhood education and other things that we know are incredibly important for us. So um, I'm really happy about this presentation because it means that we're planning ahead. As Councilmember Hucker said, uh, we normally do this in the context of budget, and so I'm really happy that we have this in advance uh, so that we can start having these conversations now and really start flushing out some of these ideas uh, you know, of course, obviously, we need to sit down and talk with our stakeholders, uh, but I look forward uh, to that opportunity so that we can all come together and really create a budget that's going to make sure that Montgomery County has a uh, sustainable future. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. All right, that concludes our, present, our discussion. Thank you for the work that you did to pull this research together, and we'll continue the conversation in the new year. And now we have an interview. We have an applicant for the Board of Appeals, Ms. Bernadette Garrett. Hello, Ms. Garrett. Yes, please uh, make yourself comfortable. There's a button at the base of this microphone. And press that, please. If you could press the button at the at the base of there you go, and welcome to the county council. Thank you for uh, volunteering to serve on the board of appeals, and we are really pleased to have a chance to interview you today, um, Ms. Garrett. So, I'll begin, and we have some prepared questions, as you know. Why do you want to become a member of the board of appeals? Well, first of all, good afternoon, board members. I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to interview today. And for me, when it comes to serving, my family is civic minded. Everyone in my family has served in the community in some form or fashion. And I believe it's sort of in our DNA. And serving in the military as well as other volunteer organizations that I'm involved in, serving is it's not necessarily a uh, it's just what I do, and it's what this way I learn, and the way I can get involved in the community and learn more about the community. Thank you so much. What in your background prepares you to serve on the board? I'd have to say, when it comes to my experience, I've had the blessing of being in the military for close to 28 years, and in that time, in leadership roles that I had an opportunity to execute duties in, it required me to serve on a lot of committees and working groups. And as you know, there's always competing ideas when it comes to these working groups and, I, and committees. When I engage in these committees and work groups, I have to take into consideration their requirements, the stakeholders, the diversity of those stakeholders, of what they want and need to get out of a project, some of the mission accomplishments that need to take place for each of these, st these stakeholders. And I've been fortunate in the fact that the team members that I engage in and the real groups that I participate in have been successful most, <laughs> in most cases. And the things that I've learned and the expertise that I afford these work groups help to, help to have those successes. 
Thank you. I should just say for anyone watching that you've had more than 15 years of U.S. Air Force experience. I'm reading from your resume, but uh, in organizational and operations management, developing and implementing system platforms and requirements that require that directly contributed to business development strategic objectives. I could go on, but you have a lot of managerial experience and operations experience, and your, your responses certainly reflect that. Please explain your understanding of the role of the Board of Appeals. No, sorry. Tell us about a time where you have helped to achieve consensus among groups or individuals with differing points of view. Again, I'll restate, I've had a lot of leadership opportunities and most of them dealing with personnel as well as other stakeholders in different locations and different backgrounds. And I reflect upon two items, one from my professional background and it, it's one of those organizations as a nonprofit. It's called Project Management Day of Service. And this was the biggest challenging group that I've ever been a part of. And I do it every year. And the purpose of this particular event is to get a group of project managers together to service a nonprofit business. We are to get together and brainstorm ideas as well as build a solution for that business owner by the end of the day. We're talking about six hours. So I believe one of my challenging and one of my most rewarding experiences in getting consensus is teaming with other project managers from different backgrounds and professions in order to come to a solution for a nonprofit business so they can meet their objective and be successful in their endeavor for their business. And from a, that was from a volunteer standpoint as well as a professional standpoint, but professionally from my experience in the military is dealing with a lot of different locations, and I mean geographically different locations at one time to achieve a common goal. And the diverse backgrounds, and I do mean countries, as well as the actual mission to be accomplished. It takes time. It takes thoughtful planning and thoughtful engagement with these individuals in order to come to a successful resolution when it came to uh, the project that we endeavored. And they were training exercises that we put together, and these were year-long events. So they were successful, and I would have to say, based off of getting consensus, it's required to be able to have that skill and technique and openness to different ideas and different protocols, of course, within certain guidelines, to be able to come to a resolution. Thoughtful engagement to come to a successful resolution. Sounds like you could be a council member. Thank you very much. Please explain your understanding of the role of the Board of Appeals and how it serves our community. After some research, as well as as I get more engaged in the community, it appears to me that the council provides a form to the community, the residents in the community, in order for them to voice their concern on issues, as well as an opportunity to engage and advocate for resources that's available to them from the community or from the county. And I think the board serves as a great venue, well, yeah, forum, in order for those individuals to be able to exercise options and opportunities. Thank you. And are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? No, not at this time. I do not believe there are. And will you be able to make the time and commitment required for service to the board? Again, I look to serve. And when making a commitment 
you have to make sure that you have the time to be able to do that, and I will. Well, Ms. Garrett, thank you very much. We really appreciate your stepping up to offer to serve, and uh, we will be in touch with you shortly. I'm quite sure you'll earn our support. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. All right, very good. There's no action on that at this moment. And now we turn to our consent calendar. We need a motion. So moved. Been Second. moved by Ms. Navarro, seconded by Mr. Katz. And all those in favor of the consent calendar, show of hands. That is unanimous among those present. We have a quorum, just barely. All right, and now we will turn to discussion and action on a resolution to approve the FY20 council grants process. And we'll have Ms. Chen, Ms. Latham, Ms. McMillan. Or is that Mr. Latham? No. Ms. Latham. Okay. Um, Why don't you take us away? Carolyn Chen. Hi, everyone. Happy snow day. Happy snow day. OK, so we have two things to do today. One, action. Second, discussion. So let's talk about the action first. Um, the joint HHS and GEO committees met twice on October 11th and the 25th, and they discussed what we could revise and change for this upcoming FY20 grants process. And you'll see on the first page, the joint committee recommended changes to the application process to revise council priorities for grant applications and engage the incoming and executive staff for FY20 and 21 and beyond. On the next page, number two, you'll see the two, I highlighted the two major ch uh, changes to the resolution, which is um, on the circle numbers. Uh, Number three, which will look familiar to the committee, or actually most of you guys, um, the revised language on, um, on our priorities for proposals, including uh, before and after school programs for discipline and youth, um, link, uh, innovative, innovative programs for linkages between education and workforce, addressing social isolation among social populations, and accelerating the county's greenhouse greenhouse gas reduction goals. Um, just to make a point, uh, when during our discussion, this does not preclude anyone else to apply. It actually just provides a focus. But in the first paragraph, we emphasized what was what uh, what we're looking for, which were organizations that exhibit cultural proficiency, use a racial equity lens in delivering services, and demonstrate a commitment to sustainability with diverse funding sources. Uh, number 10 was what we talked about that we were going to have in the resolution that the council staff will meet with the incoming county executive. Hi, Mark. <laughs> and the executive staff. <laughs> really soon. <laughs> Hold the date, January. <laughs> so, uh, that we'll be meeting um, with with uh, the incoming county executive staff uh, very, very soon on the application that will be opening on December 5th. Um, I think we're meeting on December 4th <laughs> and um, in January to discuss 21 and beyond. So if anyone wants to comment on from the joint HHS GEO committees on this, we would like to vote to act on this, right? Yeah. Great. <clears throat> We've had some good discussion on this. Um, Mr. Leventhal. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I really want to thank Carolyn and Linda McMillan um, and Linda Price, who all worked on this, and I do think that it represents a significant step forward. Uh, the uh, memo that's before you was um, approved by the Joint Committee, and we commend it to the full council. I hope that um, our next county executive will work with the county council. Uh, this is my personal hope. The um, Joint Committee did not opine on this specific issue, it is my view that a single grants process shared between the council and executive is preferable to um, the process that we have now. But I think that the recommendations in this document, which only the, the, which the council can adopt on its own authority, um, represent a significant step forward, and I think they will clarify and make it easier for applicants to understand what it is we expect of them. Um, and as we move forward, uh, 
I hope that there will be a more transparent and fair and competitive process based on merit, um, and that will not preclude the council, as the county council did this year, from responding to urgent needs that emerge, such as um, at the time there was a concern about gang activity, the council uh, provided a competitive opportunity for positive youth development programs at the time that there was at the time that many of our constituents were living in fear because of increased immigration enforcement activity, um, we responded by soliciting applications from service providers to assist with legal aid. So as, as urgent needs emerge, nothing precludes the executive or council from suggesting funding to meet those needs, but um, providing a more transparent and fairer uh, grants process, I think, is in everybody's best interest. Thank you. Ms. Navarro. Yeah, I want to thank the Joint Committee, uh, HHS uh, and GO, as well as Ms. Chen and Ms. McMillan and Ms. Price. I mean, there's been so much conversation about how to um, enhance this whole entire process, make it, as Council um, Member Leventhal said, much more, um, I think, predictable. I mean, it's so important for organizations to understand exactly where we're headed. Um, and, you know, in many ways, it's also tied to the previous conversation. We have to look at everything that we're doing and how we're utilizing our resources. Um, so to the extent that we can begin to align um, something like a grants process with our priorities, looking at sustainability, look at issues of scalability in some instances as well, um, I think it's the right thing to do in terms of good government. So very excited about these very first steps and look forward to you reporting back to us what your discussions will be uh, with the incoming executive, but I think we have laid out um, a pretty good blueprint for, for how to move forward and really appreciate also the input for so many from so many stakeholders, uh, who will, many of them are the recipients of these grants um, that uh, will benefit. Uh, an additional, I think, benefit of all this is that we do know that there are lots of other organizations out there doing very innovative work, um, and many of them just haven't had access uh, to these funds, and so I'm hoping that we will begin to see uh, at the same time some um, organizations with innovative approaches coming forward and, and hopefully, you know, being recipients as well. So, good job. Mr. Rice. Yeah, well, I just want to echo the sentiments of uh, both uh, Councilmember Leventhal and Councilmember Navarro as the veteran who will be returning on the Health and Human Services Committee. I hope that we continue the spirit of what we've seen this year in terms of progress. Uh, in my conversations with many organizations uh, who have been very supportive of the direction that we're going in, but also express some angst uh, in ensuring that some of the most uh, basic uh, uh, needs continue to be met via their service delivery, I think that a single stream model certainly does address those issues and allows for us to really start focusing on putting some of those core services into our base budget while still allowing the innovation that Council Member Navarro was talking about to occur. I mean, it really is the perfect storm for us. And when we were just having this conversation about streamlining and ensuring that we have a process uh, that makes sense for folks, but also it's cost savings. I mean, to our organizations who have to write uh, and spend time applying to both the county executive and to the council, uh, those things take away from their actual service delivery. And so from that perspective, I, I don't want to be lost what's happening today. Uh, with these recommendations. This is going to mean significant impacts on a lot of our, uh, our nonprofits throughout Montgomery County. And I think that there's even more that we can do to take it to the next level with some of the implementation that may happen with our new uh, county executive elect as well. So thank you guys. Very good. I'll uh, add my voice to the chorus and particularly want to thank Mr. Elrich. I think you're signaling that this is something you embrace is uh, just means a lot. Well done, thank you. All right, we have a recommendation before us. This is a show of hands. All those in favor? That is unanimous among those present. Mr. President? Yes. Um, you, your uh, Board of Appeals interview went quicker than I expected. Could yeah. I be uh, recorded uh, in the affirmative on the consent calendar items? Absolutely. Thank you. And Mr. Ucker as well. All right. Um, now I'm going to ask for a motion to go into closed session to conduct or discuss an investigative proceeding on actual or possible criminal conduct.
Pursuant to Maryland Annotated Code General Provisions Article 3305A12, the topic is discussion of investigative proceeding on possible criminal conduct. So moved. Been moved by Ms. Devaro, second by Mr. Rice. All those in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous among those present. However, we're scheduled for that at 1255. I think we'll keep to that time probably because the people who will be briefing us, I don't see. So we will reconvene at 1255 for that closed session in the room behind us. Thank you.